Welcome. In this fifth lecture, we cover algebra. In the first part, we look at equations. But first, the definition of algebra. It's going to be a little bit tricky because algebra means two things. In school, we understand it as the science of algebraic operations and manipulations. And in general mathematics, it's mostly the science of algebraic structures like groups or rings, abstract algebra. But we can combine these two things and say that algebra is a tool to solve equations and puzzles. In short, it's all about solving the cubic and solving the rubic. First, uh, we need a language. Let's look at an algebraic expression. If you have variables x and y, and we want to evaluate this expression 2x over 3y minus 1 if x is equal to 9 and y is equal to 2. Can you tell what the, uh, what the result is? What did you get? Did you get 2 or did you get 11? <clears throat> You probably got two, like most humans. The reason is the rule PEMDAS, which puts multiplication m before division d. can be remembered with the uh, sentence, please excuse my dear aunt Sally. What does the computer tell? Here is what happens if we enter it to Mathematica. No, it's not 42. 42. The meaning of life and everything. The computer gives 11. The upshot is use brackets. The expression was ambiguous. Here's some literature. If you are interested, a nice article of Tara Helle explains it well. It quotes Kayori, who wrote once, even al arithmetical or al algebraic term contains division and multiplication. There is a present no agreement as to which sign shall be used first. <coughs> So let's look uh, at some equations now. You can classify polynomial equations according to their degree. Linear equations, degree one, were solved by Babylonian mathematicians already. Thousands of years later, in the same area, the first quadratic equations were solved. Then came an interesting battle for the cubic quartic, and finally a dramatic tale about the quintic. <clears throat> One of the founders of algebra was Al-Gabiri. He was the first to solve the quadratic equation systematically. His name survives today in the name algorithm. Algebra means mending broken bones in Arabic. <clears throat> this is a page from the book Algebra, which Al-Gabiri wrote. He worked in the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. This intellectual center was the Silicon Valley of that time. <clears throat> it was an intellectual center during the Islamic Golden Age between the 9th and 13th century. Even so algebra was invented then, there were no variables in use at that time. Everything was geometric. We see here a page from algebra and also an English translation. <clears throat> the use of symbols came only much later with François Viet, who lived from 1540 to 1603. Viet's work was uh, master work is the Opera Mathematica written in 1646. In it, the first symbolic manipulations with variables have appeared. But let's look, now look at the quadratic equation. Uh, like al Kabiri, we assume b and c to be positive and write it as x squared plus bx is equal to c. So historically, this was first written like that. Uh, uh, because uh, with positive entries, because everything, all the uh, meaning were uh, the meaning of the uh, expressions were were areas. Uh, so let's look at that. The equation can be represented as a geometric riddle. So in order to solve the equation, we have uh, to we have x squared. That's an area, and then we have a, a, a b uh, half. Uh, uh, b, b half times x and b half times x, these are two rectangles. If you add them, this gives you bx, so the blue part is just means bx. And you see there's a missing square, so we have to add a square there. That's called the completion of the square. Now we have a complete square, and so we have x plus b half squared, and that's our c. So uh, we can now solve that for x. The genius move. And we have a solution of the quadratic equation. <clears throat> uh, in, a, in a modern form, it's usually the C is put on the other side, and then we get these familiar uh, equations for the solutions of the quadratic equation. There are two solutions. Uh, so, if an example like x squared plus x minus 12 is equal to 0, and if you apply this formula, we get 3 or minus 4. And we can then factor the, the quadratic uh, polynomial as x minus 3 times x plus 4. And this factorization is quite useful because we see that minus 12 is the product of the solution, 
we get also uh, the sum of the solutions is the, the minus b part. Uh, we can also see it graphically. So if you write y is equal to x plus x minus 12, see a parabola, and the roots which we were computing, this is the, these are the intersections of this parabola with the x-axis. So uh, as mentioned, this, this factorization can be used in SAT type, type tricks to, to find solutions quickly. So we know the product, the c is the product of the two solutions and the minus b is the sum of the two solutions. Like here, the, we know the sum is 1 and the, the product is minus 12. So uh, we have a, a either 3 and 3 and 4, 3 and minus 4 or 4 minus 3. These are, uh, these are possibilities. One of them is negative, so the larger one has to be positive. So we get, uh, we get the solutions in our head. <clears throat> What about higher order equations? So if we look at this in the rest of this first part, each is an interesting story. First the cubic, we completely solve the cubic, and then the quartic, completely solve the quartic, and then comes a, a surprise with the quintic, as we will see. <clears throat> so first, uh, before we do that, we can solve some equations with the higher order uh, polynomials, with the knowledge of quadratic equations only. We will do that uh, quickly uh, in breakout rooms. <clears throat> What about uh, 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 guessing the solution? So that's often when, when a higher order polynomial appears in a in a problem. Students can just try, you know, with integers and see if you guess a solution. Uh, like if you try two, what happens when you put two? Then you get eight minus forty-two minus that doesn't work. When you put x equal to one, however, x equal to one works because one minus twenty-one plus um, no, that doesn't work. Minus one works. That's minus 1 uh, plus 21 minus 20. That works, so minus 1 is your solution. So you just try it out. Let's now look at the cubic. This is the form of a general cubic equation. Uh, it appears, for example, in angle trisection. Uh, the cosine of alpha third can be given as a solution of a cubic uh, equation. The cardinal Tartaglia formula, which we are going to look at, is, is actually quite, quite easy to derive. You just make first a change of variables. So the, the capital X variable, which was originally there, you replace with small x minus a third. That has the effect that the, uh, you get an equation which doesn't have any more a quadratic term. We call this a depressed version of the, of the cubic. And then you make a second uh, substitution. You, you say x is u minus p over 3u. And then you make the computation and you see that you get now an equation for u, which involves u to the 6 and u to the 3 only, so that you can use a quadratic equation. So uh, to the right, uh, you have the Mathematica code if you just want to quickly do it. Or you can also uh, calculate that on paper with some, with some time. But that's the complete solution of the uh, cubic. You could write down a formula. Uh, so the discovery uh, is it's an interesting story about the discovery. It was kind of a three-person fight. Uh, nowadays, uh, Tartaglia and Cardano are mostly credited for the discovery, but, but Del Ferro played a role too, and he was independently found, found a solution too. Uh, here is the story is told in Wikipedia. So a short uh, thing is the cardinal asked Tartaglia for the solution, promised not to publish it, and then he saw the unpublished work of Del Ferro, who came up independently with a solution. Cardinal then broke his promise and included his version in a publication. Of course, Tartaglia was pissed and publicly insulted Cardano. Little cat fight. Uh, for solving the quartic, uh, qu uh, the quartic, again, one can do that with a change of variables. So you get first rid of the cubic term, like a depressed version. And then, that's kind of ingenious, you write it as a product of two quadratic equations. But the A, B, C, D are unknown. But you can solve it using the cubic uh, equation. You can solve for A, B, C, D. And then if the solutions, uh, uh, if the A, B, C, D are given, we have two quadratic equations, which can then be solved using the quadratic or quadratic formula. Uh, this uh, kind of product of two quadratic equations appears in the Ms. movie Ms. Hidden Ms. Figures. Why don't, you, why don't you solve the equation on the It's board? a situation where the quartic can be solved. And in some sense, this special case is also the key to solve the uh, uh, quartic equation. <clears throat> 
if the product of two terms is zero, then common sense says at least one of the two terms has to be zero to start with. So if you move all the terms over to one side, you move with the quadratics into a form that can be factored, allowing that side of the equation to equal zero. Once you've done that, it's pretty straightforward from there. In all my years, all my years of teaching, I've never seen, I've never seen a mind like the one your daughter has. Uh, it was Ferrari, uh, Lodovici Ferrari, who was, is credited for the solution. Uh, he collaborated with uh, Cardano. Uh, there's no picture of Ferrari, unfortunately. What about the Quintic? So this is an interesting story. It turns out that there is no formula anymore. It cannot be solved with radicals. This is a theorem of Abel Ruffini of 1824. We will look at that. An example of a, 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 a quintic which cannot be solved is x to the 5 minus x plus 1. Ruffini uh, uh, published something, but it was not quite solid. Abel was uh, really approving it. And Galois uh, had a whole theory, in which, uh, which is called Galois theory nowadays. So he, he wrote this down in a in a letter while uh, 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 in, the, in the night before he was uh, he was dueling himself, and Hermann Weil, another great mathematician from the 20th century, said, "This letter, if judged by the novelty and profundity of ideas it contains, is perhaps the most substantial piece of writing in the whole literature of mankind." So that's uh, uh, mathematicians are very excited about it. It's an exciting theory. This. Galois theory, and there is an entire book telling the story, Duel at Dawn, uh, from the summary in the fog of a Paris dawn in 1832, Evarist Galois, the 20-year-old founder of modern algebra, was shot and killed in a duel. That gunshot suggests, Samir Alexander, marks the end of an area in mathematics and the beginning of another. So here are some of the many artist renderings of that event, and this was the end of Galois. It was also the end of this first part A. In this part B, we look at symmetries. Symmetries form an algebraic object called a symmetry group. <clears throat> it's important in many different parts of mathematics, from geometry, starting with Plato. You've seen it, Felix Klein characterized geometries using symmetries, and Amy Noether made a beautiful theorem, discovered a beautiful theorem. Uh, Noether's theorem, which relates conservation laws in physics with symmetries. Translation of symmetry gives you momentum conservation, time symmetry gives energy conservation, rotational symmetry gives angular momentum conservation, then gauge symmetries, internal symmetries, which are relevant in particle physics, the theory by Lof Sophus Lee. <clears throat> so, symmetries are important in art. And, and up to particle physics, sometimes it's also important to uh, have uh, broken symmetry. See Picasso's Femme or Chapeau, which obviously plays with symmetry. And also particle physics, particle physics is the broken symmetry of them, which is interesting. Symmetries are appealing. Uh, you, here's the, a kaleidoscope, which I just recently bought and took some photos with the uh, phone. <coughs> Platonic solids are aesthetically pleasing because of their symmetry. There are five. We will talk about them later in another part of this course. <clears throat> in part A, we have learned that the Quintic equation has no solution formula. This is now called the abel ruffini theorem. The connection with symmetry is not apparent, but uh, Ruffini already looked at the permutation group of the solutions, <clears throat> essentially started what we call today group theory. An example of an equation which cannot be solved uh, using radicals is uh, uh, the one given here, uh, 2x to the 5 minus 10x plus 5 equals 0. I see there are five solutions. We have a permutation group with five elements, which is relevant. And the upshot basic idea is that uh, if an equation has a solvable solution, then the corresponding permutation group is a solvable group. It turns out that the permutation group of four elements forms still a solvable group, but that the permutations of five elements don't. So this is explains this break from 4 to 5. <clears throat> what is a symmetry transformation? Let's look at, at geometry. Here is a, one of the simplest cases of a geometric object. It's an isosceles triangle. There are two symmetry operations. 
The first one is the identity. The second one is the reflection at the symmetry axis. We can now form a multiplication table. Identity times identity gives the identity. Identity times flip gives flip. Flip times identity gives flip. And flip times flip gives the identity. <coughs> uh, let's fill the multiplication table for a rectangle. So there are now four symmetry operations. The identity and the rotation by 180 degrees. There is the x flip and there is the y flip. So first of all it's easy to fill the first row and first column as the multiplication with the identity both from the left or right gives the same result. So for example uh, if we take the identity first and then flip by x then we get the flip by x. So we have already part of that table. Now uh, let's do first the rotation by 180 degrees, that's the left column, then make an x flip. So we claim that this gives, this gives a y flip. We can see this as follows. So a goes to c, right? If we uh, rotate by 180 degrees, a goes to c. Then under the flip, c goes to b. So when we combine that, a goes to b. Similarly, we see that d goes to b. 180 degrees and then B goes to A. So that D goes to A in total we see that this is a Y flip. So we have the Y flip here already entered. And now comes an interesting thing. The last entry can be obtained by Sudoku rules. In every row and every column each of the operations, each of the uh, symmetry operations can only appear once. So the last entry has to be a x. It's a conse consequence of the group law. Every operation produces a, a permutation of the, of the uh, group. <clears throat> Every operation has an inverse. Um, let's see now, we are already quite well off. The diagonal we can still co complete. So if, uh, if we combine an x-flip with an x-flip to get the identity, and the y-flip times an y-flip gives the identity. And now we are in a good shape because we can use Sudoku to fill that uh, uh, rest. So the 180 in the last column comes from Sudoku and now we have also can use Sudoku for the third row, right? And then we are finished. We cannot fill the, the last uh, thing, the x and 180 in the last row uh, can be filled. So this is the multiplication table. This is a, a abelian group. We see that uh, if you take first operation times the second it's the same. We, if you do the reverse thing. <clears throat> now uh, for the square uh, we have much more symmetry so we, you do that in a homework, complete that in a homework but let's let's just look at one entry. What happens if we do a combination of AC, AC is the diagonal flip uh, through the points AC, we take AC flip and then an X flip. So let's do that. We take, let's look what happens with the point A, if you take an AC flip, A stays, and then we make an X flip, A goes to B. So we have seen A goes to B. And then B, what happens with B when we take an AC flip, it goes to D, but then we make an X flip, D goes to C. So B goes to C. And we have seen A goes to B, B goes to C, actually C goes to D, D goes to A, we see we have a 90 degree rotation. That's why uh, we have entered 90 here in the multiplication AC times X. <clears throat> So that's uh, quite a bit of work, but uh, uh, let's uh, admit the coloring already gives a hint what happens. So, but let's take x and then multiply the x flip and multiply it with the ac flip. So if you take the x flip, a goes to b, and then we take the uh, ac flip, b goes to d. So a has gone to d now. So, uh, uh, and if we do the, uh, the other point, we see that this is actually a rotation by 270 degrees. So you see that AC times X gives 90 degree rotation, and X times AC gives 270 degree rotation. This is not an abelian group, so it's a little bit more tricky to fill that out, but uh, uh, you, it's your task to, 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 to do, that, uh, do that table. Uh, this is an example we do in class. It's a symmetry group of an equilateral triangle. It has six symmetry operations, so it has three uh, rotations, identity, 120 degree and 140 degree rotation, and then there are three reflections, the reflections at the, at the altitudes, <clears throat> and we do that in class. And this is the end of part B. In this last part 
of the algebra lecture, we look at puzzles. It turns out that all puzzles are groups. They are at the heart of algebra. <clears throat> Let's start with the 15 puzzle. I've played it a lot as a kid. And you see on the right my own solution path just recorded uh, on an online version of the puzzle. I used 331 moves. The god number is believed to be about the half. The god number is the worst case scenario, but done with almighty wisdom. Obviously, my own path was only half divine. Uh, you see that I especially struggled with the last part, uh, bringing the last row into order. You see, we have permutations, and uh, now we have solved the puzzle. So history, so this puzzle was invented in 1874 by a postmaster from Canastota in New York. Uh, it made it to Syracuse and then uh, was uh, manufactured in Hartford and then sold in Boston. So it's a pretty local story. Uh, puzzle maker Sam Lloyd offered a prize for the solution in which two elements uh, were switched. It turns out this cannot be solved. He offered thousand dollars for the solutions. Other people have offered prizes. Uh, uh, we know that it cannot be done. Here's an article which uh, uh, explains this. Uh, it's pretty easy uh, to see once you uh, have the idea. So we have two distances. So if you have a position, we have the number of transpositions, flips of two elements which are needed to get to the permutation, uh, solution permutation. But then we have also the position of the hole, and that uh, uh, we look at the uh, distance of the hole to the end position. So if we add up these two positions, we get always an even number. There's a parity which is invariant. Every time you make a move, like if you move 12 down here, for example, you switch two elements, the 12 and 16, and you also move the whole by one. So in total, we have changed the parity by two. Now, if you start with uh, switching 14 and 15, then the parity changes and you cannot solve it. The call number of the 15 puzzle is uh, not known. It's a bit surprising, given it is much simpler then, for example, the Rubik cube, where one knows the God number. So it's between 152 and 208. I needed 330 in that demonstration before. But it's a group. It's a permutation group. The number of positions is 16 factorial, all the permutations of 16. But then there's this parity, uh, which gives, divides this by 2. So we have 10 trillion positions. The Rubik cube is also a permutation puzzle. So what we permute is a 20, 26 cubes. But you see the corner cubes say uh, the same and the edge cubes say the same. So you can count also here the number of possibilities. Uh, 8 factorial, 3 to the 8, 12 factorial, 2 to the 12. That would be kind of if you naively do it. But then there, is a par there are parities, parities for the corners and parities for the edges, which give you divide, ha ha allow you to divide by 2. So there are 43 quint quintillion uh, positions. It has been event invented uh, just about 100 years after the 15 puzzle by Erno Rubik. Uh, it can be solved very quickly now. The world record 2017 is 4.69 seconds. Here's a movie from a record in 2011 when it was still over uh, 5 seconds. Bum, bum. A nice uh, simple uh, version is when you just take the roof of the Rubik's Cube. Now we have only 192 positions. We can permute all the corners, which gives four factorial positions. The corners we need, we can then flip four edges. Uh, so we have two to the four. So four, four factorial times two to the four. But then we have also a parity because each time you make a move, you actually change the number of permutation, the permutation, the transposition number for the for the for the for the corners and also uh, the uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, one of the edges. So there are 192 uh, elements. This is pretty small. We can actually see the entire group. But you see the Cayley graph of this group. Each node is a position permutation. Two are combined. If you can do a move, bringing one to the other. So we can just look at that graph and see the God number is the diameter of that graph. And the God number is six. 
the two times two Ruby cube is uh, called a pocket cube, cube, a much smaller number of uh, uh, four times four times four times four uh, a cube has already already ten to the forty five or forty six uh, positions. So we cannot even write down the multiplication table in our universe because there are just not enough particles. We would need ten to the ninety. Uh, uh, right, 10 to the 90 uh, numbers now. Uh, so we can also restrict, uh, uh, it's kind of fun to restrict it and make smaller groups which can be better understood, sub-puzzles, and then there are Ruby cubes based on platonic solids, like here the pyramids uh, based on the tetrahedron is especially simple. And so here are a very simple one, the pyramid X is almost a joke. <laughs> Uh, when I was a grad student, there was a master ball came out. It's also a Rubik's Cube type thing. Um, uh, it had been a competition in Bern where I participated. I had actually c computed the solution with a, ma ma uh, with a Kaylee, which is kind of a computer algebra system. And uh, so I had a recipe. Uh, but the competition was then uh, uh, done on a stage in a, in a disco. <laughs> Nobody was really interested in as we were announced as master of minds. And uh, we had to flip two elements and I started just to make one or two of these hundred moves I had to do. Uh, uh, the computer gave me this uh, uh, solution. But the winner of the competition was finished before I even started to make the third move. It was a cheese maker from Emmental. Uh, I asked him how he did it. Uh, he obviously did not know any group theory, but understood that puzzle. Uh, very well. Obviously a, a Goodwill Hunting story, but a true one, not invented one like the Goodwill Hunting movie. People have also built a 40 Rubik cube, like here we see uh, uh, how, how one can do that on a computer. So you just now uh, turn three-dimensional cubes and uh, in the same way you can, you can solve that. Uh, there are masters who can do all the cubes very, very quickly. So here is one who solves the 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, then the 3 times 3 times 3, 4 times 4 times 4, all in a, uh, a, a very short time. Pretty amazing how, how these guys can, uh, can do that so quickly, etc. Uh, finally, uh, what is a group? It is a set of elements in which one can multiply. One has associativity, one has a zero element, and one has also an inverse. And a ring is also a beautiful structure. We know that from numbers. The integers form a ring. One has an addition and a multiplication, but one can do that also abstractly. Or then polynomials. We come back to the start of the lecture. Another ring relevant in quantum mechanics is the ring of matrices. This is an example of a ring which is not commutative. The multiplication behaves like a permutation of the symmetry of a triangle or the moves in a Rubik cube. And here are finally some book suggestions. And this is the end of part three and the end of the algebra lecture.